Notice he avoided saying what year he graduated. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, I'm Sylvia Spector, I'm the Director of Admissions and Financial Aid. Three kids for eight graduates. So, what you're gonna what you're gonna see here today is a presentation on where we are as a school. And historically, what we used to do was speak specifically to the finances, which we will again. But this particular presentation is really about the whole school, and it's an integrated perspective, and it's not meant to give you all of the information, but to raise the questions for you so that you will ask them, whether it's here or some other place, because it's material that we think every single person associated with the school should know. So uh, I'm going to hand it to, to Sue, who's going to orchestrate uh, the digital program. When it's over, we'll handle some questions for this, and uh, then questions about anything else. And by the way, our division heads, or the voice of our division <laughs> We'll share a couple of things happening with you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Um, so as Steve said, don't worry if you're here for the finances, they're here. Uh, but what we're going to do is provide some context within the umbrella of the strategic plan, because that's how we've been working, and I think it might be a nice way of bringing you up to date. Um, and we are on YouTube, the uh, Should Be TV YouTube channel, so welcome to anybody who's watching online. And if you know anyone who wanted to be here today but couldn't, that will be available <coughs> after the meeting as well. Um, so uh, we work with this all the time, but I thought it would be a nice kind of reset to remind you all of the strategic vision for our strategic plan, which was completed just a year ago, March, or maybe two years this March. We inspire and prepare each of our students to live a life of purpose, to grow intellectually, act compassionately, and lead courageously. There are three goals. There are three kind of equal pillars of this, and you're going to hear a little bit about each one educational excellence, community engagement, institutional stewardship. Um, I have the lead on the community engagement, and a number of you in the room have been active, actively involved in that work for a couple of years. Um, Wendy, Tim, and Shane, and Margaret, uh, without voice, are gonna be talking a little bit about educational excellence. And then institutional stewardship is where we'll get to the financial piece. Um, and so, this is a list not to be intimidating, but these are the first most important things that we've been working on, particularly for the last year. And I'm gonna read through them really briefly, and we are not gonna cover every one of these today, but just to give you an idea, there is a new um, uh, instructor faculty evaluation system that's being piloted, piloted this year. Uh, there's professional development. We always do professional development, but the professional development that supports the educational excellence tenets of the plan. Backwards design, which I don't know if Wendy's going to talk about today, but maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Curriculum 2022, which is looking at ahead, and again, backwards design. What do we want our graduates to be prepared to do, and what does that mean for our graduation requirements in 2022? And that's been a, a fun project. An interdisciplinary task force, positive education. Hopefully everybody in the room is, is somewhat aware of that. Um, Adam's going to talk briefly about a colleague compensation study. I know that's been an issue that's come up and then the 125th anniversary, which Josie and I are gonna cover in a little bit. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the um, Educational Excellence team, and I think Tim's gonna, gonna start. Um, so just before I talk a little bit about the strategic plan, I just wanna share a couple of happenings in the lower school. Um, the third grade just finished a truly interdisciplinary study where they um, read books in small groups, and we do small group um, books, um, small group book talks with kindergarten through fifth grade. And they just finished a book on Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King, a biography. And it um, integrated language arts, looking at um, comprehension strategies for nonfiction books, social studies, looking at the birth of the civil rights movement, and also positive education as kids identified character strengths um, as they read through the book. They're actually moving now into building on that, they're looking at um, children and groups of children who were catalysts for the civil rights movement, continuing with um, on the study biographies. In fourth grade, they're also doing a small book, um, book group talks today, one of my favorite activities, which is the um, Tea Party, where they look at books by Roland Dahl, mm -hmm. um, Charlie of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Matilda, and kids have been reading the books for the last month, so they break up into small um, groups, talk about their favorite <laughs> books, and be served tea and sandwiches and all kinds of goodies by parents. 
who will be dressed up as um, uh, waiters to serve them. It's mm -hmm. really fun. Um, and they have China and everything. It's, it's, it's a great event. Um, but connecting back to the strategic plan, there's a couple of things that we've been doing around curriculum design. Back before the winter break, we actually met all of the teaching colleagues and we met in small groups across divisions and subjects to talk about how we think about deeply rooted learning. Um, out of that work, we've been identifying what we call transfer goals, which is what are the kinds of learning we want kids to have when they leave Shipley. And then that will play into the backwards by design curriculum model that Sue mentioned, which is really thinking about designing curriculum units um, by what are the key essential understandings we want kids to have. What are, how are we going to assess that? And then what are the activities that are going to build those kinds of understandings? And it's a model that we're going to be implementing from pre-K through 12th grade. And I think Margaret's going to mention a little bit about its connection to um, um, as you move into graduation requirements, I think. Um, so that gives you an idea of kind of where we are, some of the thinking around strategic plans. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Shane. Easy. And I apologize if my voice is coming. My voice is coming back. Yesterday was, was worse. Uh, science, I'm just going to talk a little bit about science in the middle school right now. I got a chance to get in to see the sixth graders the other day, and they have started, if you have a sixth grader, you'll notice, but they're starting to do ice penguins, and they're trying to figure out how to put an ice cube penguin the, inside a little storage container and have it last, remain as an ice cube for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So they've been looking at the study of energy and, and heat transfer. So when I walked into the class, they, were, they had their little ice cube ice penguins, and they were all trying to figure out what's the best design for a module to, to keep them inside. Uh, it builds on, on sort of work they've been doing before. It's very hands-on, but it also involves technology. It involves sort of the engineering process, building models, testing them, looking at the failure, looking at the success rate, and then trying to build the next better version of it. So that's an amazing to see that piece. Coming in the seventh grade, if you have a seventh grader right now, they are in the middle of their choices unit. So they've done their parent interview at home. Some of you in the high school probably remember this piece. They've done their parent interview. They're going to start looking at pop songs pretty soon, where they take the lyrics from a song and analyze it. And, and they will also do the birthday babies later. I think what was most relevant, I was in the class yesterday, in light of the movie we, we, we sort of demo for, for families last week or this week, they were looking at body image and <coughs> Snapchat and sort of what happens when, when someone puts a picture on, on, on Snapchat and what's going on in, in people's minds. So they're really kind of bringing across other areas into, into that class. In the eighth grade, they are getting into the nuts and bolts of actually cutting up, dissecting bullseyes and sheep's hearts mm -hmm. uh, as part of their anatomy study. So, if you have a if you have a good good stomach and a strong nose, <laughs> so by that the, the upper school or the middle school science stuff, and you will smell and see some of the dissections in, in operation. They're really really good, and it's amazing how quickly they get over their fears and, and sort of the the sense of dread from the smells. They really get into it quickly, and then they're like, oh look. <laughs> so it's pretty good. To flip to, to the strategic plan, one of the strands talks about attracting, retaining, and developing ex exceptional colleagues. And one of those areas underneath that is really looking at, at faculty, teaching faculty. So this year we flipped the model, Margaret Tim, Sharon, myself, and Wendy, to instead of doing sort of announced, you know, Sue, I'm going to come in and see you next Wednesday for a period, we went to an unscheduled drop in model for observation. So the administrators are popping into classes for 10 to 15 minutes unannounced at any point during the day. It can be the first part of the class, the last part of the class, it can be the morning, it can be the evening, it can be midday, and just getting in there for 10, 15 minutes. You can see an awful lot, you can learn an awful lot. Following up that observation with a conversation with the teacher about what did we see, what did they see, what were the learning goals, and then following that up with a written feedback to say, hey, these, these are some things that I really thought were strengths and this is one area I think you could make immediate change on to improve tomorrow's instruction, sort of the coaching model. So that's something we've been piloting this year. It's been really effective. It's, it's getting us into the classrooms on, on an ongoing basis. The commitment is to be in there once every rotation for the colleagues who are doing it. So that's, that's a big shift from once, a, once every couple of weeks or once a month to every single rotation. Someone's in your class observing. The teachers have actually embraced the teachers you could think or be scared of it, they have embraced it. And the feedback we've got from them is it's really good to have an administrator in the classroom giving the feedback. And my voice is going, so I will hand it over to Tim. Okay, hi. In upper school, 
we're going to talk about science as well. Um, recently, there was a chemistry expo, and it was put on by um, Greg Clements and Tamara Norquist, the chemistry teachers. And what happened was the 10th graders in chemistry, or no, the, they put it on for 9th and 10th graders. And so the students in chemistry came up with their own experiments, and they looked at sort of fun things that would be great demonstrations. <coughs> And then the ninth and 10th graders came around to see all of them and walk through a set of expo style. And here are a couple of examples. There was cloud in a bottle, where they put alcohol in the bottle and then pumped, it, um, pumped in high pressure, pumped it up to high pressure with a bike pump, and then when they removed the pump, all of a sudden it condensed and they get a cloud in there. So it was all really you know, wowy to try to encourage, first of all, to sort of show what great things they're doing and also to encourage students who haven't taken chemistry yet. And let's see, oh, and cleaning pennies, this is the other one I really like. They had salt and vinegar in um, a chemical reaction with brown pennies, and then um, they returned them to their shiny copper state. So that is some of the exciting things that they are doing, and it's really exciting that they're putting this on for other students, so they really have an audience, um, and not just doing it for themselves. And then in terms of the strategic plan, what's happening in upper school, there's the 2022 committee, which is looking at graduation requirements for the class of 2022 and beyond. And so we're backward planning that and starting with the end in mind of, okay, so for the class of 2022, what do we think graduation requirements should be? Um, and we're specifically thinking about, in terms of the strategic plan, ideas of where we learn, when we learn, and with whom we learn. So the group has met several times. It includes teachers and students um, to give feedback. And we have three groups, a group that's looking at foundational coursework, a group that's looking at explorational sort of extension things, and then a group that's looking at where and how we learn. And we've had a couple of retreats, and there is one tomorrow afternoon. Good morning. Um, so some of you have seen some of these slides before, but I think it just bears repetition to reinforce and really make sure that everybody knows what we're doing with positive education. So this is the best slide or the best representation for what positive education is. It is the combination of academics and character and well-being um, together. And I think when we first saw this um, model, it really makes sense. It's what we've been doing at Shipley for a long time, and it really speaks to us in the school and where we're headed as far as positive education. Mm -hmm. um, this is why we do positive education. Um, this model comes from Dr. Seligman's work in positive psychology at Penn, the idea that we build well-being and that there's five components, positive emotions, engagement, uh, positive relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And the reason why we're doing positive education is to build, build well-being and flourishing and resilience in all members of the community. Um, there are four steps to implementing <coughs> positive education in a school, learning, living, teaching, and embedding. And as I said, um, in other settings, um, our focus is really on the learning and the living. Um, and then we will continue, obviously, to work on the teaching since we're a school. It's very important. Um, but the teaching and embedding are what comes um, as the next two steps. And just to give you a little bit of an overview, um, I have spoken about this before, but all colleagues went on a retreat in August for three days and two nights. And about 24 people stayed on to be trained as trainers. And what they have become for me are point people in the school, people who are continuing to help with the learn, live, teach, and embed process. And they come from all areas of the school. So there are teaching and non-teaching faculty in this group. Um, some of the short-term action steps, you hopefully have heard about the virtual book club. Is anybody in here doing the book club? Mm -hmm. Yes, good. <laughs> um, so we will do other things like that in February 15th from 4.30 to 6 will be the wrap up for the book club. And even if you didn't read the book but you wanted to, um, please come out. It'll be a nice event in the Lark and um, 
Erin Griffin, who was a student of Dr. Height, who read the book we're reading, will do a short presentation um, on the topics of the book, which is uh, the happiness hypothesis. Um, we've also had monthly themes for integration and department and divisions. Um, we've been working on character strengths cards. Um, everybody who wanted to could get a copy of their character strengths, and then we put them in the back of our IDs. Um, and it actually has really made for nice reminders of what people's strengths are. And um, I can, I know a lot of Cat did it, so I can kind of look at theirs. And um, we sometimes teased each other a little bit about when our character strengths are taking over, because um, that is something that can happen. You can have too much hope sometimes. Um, something I'm I, I'd, like, I'd, like to, I'd like to see that day. <laughs> elective course for the upper school next year. It will be in the course catalog and it will be, I believe, a pass-fail elective that will meet um, three times in the seven-day rotation. We're really excited about that. The February 16th in-service day for colleagues is dedicated to positive education. Um, and we do have a five-year plan. There's a roadmap, again, the learn, live, teach, and bed. Under each of those areas, there are specific steps and strategies that we're following. Um, if anybody wants more information on that, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, but I do think it's, um, it's very uh, comprehensive, um, but it's also flexible in that we can make it fit for Shipley's needs. So, that's all I have. I'm sharing this photo not only because it's just fun and cute, but it's um, a little piece of what we did this year to welcome all of our new students. Each one of the new students received a package and it had a customized photo in it of the division that they're joining. So I thought that we'd fun to start with. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the strategic plan mark that I focused most on uh, this year, this fall, um, which is the third goal uh, around stewardship and um, specifically around school size. So this fall we spent a lot of time looking at data, both our own and outside of our, our own school, looking at the schools around us and nationally. We um, spent time with some, an outside speaker in particular and with the board looking at what our priorities are and looking at what our numbers are. Um, and not only for the short term, which we are calling one to three years, but the longer term, um, well beyond that, out 10 years. Um, and what I wanted to share um, with regard to that work is where our priorities came out. Um, when the board sat down and we've had these conversations and we looked at all the data, the board really set these as their top three priorities for that work and looking forward. Um, the quality of the Shipley experience, the excellence of our program, and the selectivity of our student body, which obviously is, is helpful for us to have in mind as we're continuing to look at students and, and numbers moving forward. So that's the, the piece that I wanted to share. Um, from a re-enrollment and enrollment standpoint, I wanted to give a brief update. Um, re-enrollment went live on the 12th of January. It's due tomorrow, which is great. There uh, will be a reminder that we'll go out to families um, tomorrow just to let them know that that's the deadline. And then following that, we'll do follow-up um, individually with families um, to, to check and see if there's questions that we can answer. <coughs> contracts this year included financial aid grants. Um, right on the contracts. Uh, we have a new database that we um, have put into practice this year, and one piece of that, which I think is a real advantage, is being able to put the grants right on the contract. There's lots of retention work that happened, um, always does, but really in earnest this year, and will continue. Um, a new committee, which is um, uh, really spans different areas of our uh, community, division heads and beyond. Um, new events that we put in place to help families um, in the different divisions learn about what's next and to be able to come and see the different parts of the campus. And then current current out, outreach, which is done in a very individualized and personalized manner. I think we do a great job around retention. It's something that we can't ever rest on. We need to make sure that our current families feel excited about the school, have their <coughs> questions answered, and have opportunities for those conversations. And then new student enrollment. Um, the other big focus, of course, of our time in our office, um, our first round of, of new student offers went out on January 17th. But to give you an example, we're actually on our fourth round this week. 
So each week we'll put out more contracts as uh, the three admission committees read files. We make decisions on students. Our um, due date, which is a shared due date in the area, is March 1st, and so that's when we expect to have those back. But of course, we get uh, contracts in just about every day, which is a, a huge excitement in our office. We have, um, uh, as I had mentioned before, we have um, had everything electronic this year. So um, the contracts went out electronically. It was done through sort of a portal, a welcome email. Um, and it allowed us to um, customize it to some degree, but really to celebrate. Um, and then the package that went in the mail was really customized to the student in particular. So um, we were able to use the new system and combine. Um, the mm -hmm. photo montage was part of the electronic welcome, and we were able to customize that with the student name, um, so it really gave them a, a feel like it was for them. And then we have coming up our um, parent um, welcome, which is our yield event for, for the parents of the new students, um, and that's coming up on the 13th. But we're also doing something new this year. Sylvia has been planning an admitted students day. That is for new ninth graders this year. It's our um, first uh, really event of that nature, and so we're excited to see uh, how many students we get. We're calling all students to make sure they're planning on coming. We think it's going to be a very good day. It's very customized for each individual student. Um, Good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry, I was in the back of the room. I'm avoiding being peeled off with this blue bug that's going around. My goal is to make it through Sunday, my favorite day of the year. So, no worries. Uh, so, just give a little idea about the, uh, the financial uh, piece of the school. Uh, as you can see, there's a pie chart of our revenue. We're about a $34 million operating budget. Um, about $7 million of that is financial aid. So, we're really about a $27 million cash budget. The important piece out of this slide I want you to take away is that beyond the cost of tuition, uh, you know, we really need to raise money through the annual fund and giving in order to, to still operate. It's got a million and a half dollar uh, uh, annual fund goal, uh, somewhere around there, and, and also an endowment transfer. So your giving uh, through the annual fund is highly critical for us to uh, basically afford to operate. And I want to thank you all if you've given to the annual fund. It's just it, it, what, what helps us keep tuition at a lower rate and keeps our, our engine running forward here. Uh, so I don't know the pie chart for the expenses. It's pretty simplistic. Uh, the majority of that is salary and benefits, as we've talked about in the past. Uh, over two thirds of our costs are salary and benefits. And to give you an example of that, our healthcare budget alone for next year is over $2 million. Uh, that's one of the biggest cost drivers outside of our control. It's uh, most concerning to Steve and myself in terms of how we manage those costs. I uh, really still provide a good compensation package to our to our colleagues. Our tuition for next year ranging from $22,800 to $38,500. Uh, average increase around 3.5%. We've been trying to keep that uh, as low as possible, really the last few years uh, below 3% um, in order to stay competitive in the marketplace and also understand your costs. Uh, just to give you a sense, uh, these are the, I call it the big five local schools in the area. Um, since I started 10 years ago, this, this model has compressed. It used to be much more much broader uh, in nature, so it's, it's compressed a lot more. Um, EA and Friends Central on the bottom end, but you can see that it's getting a lot tighter than in the past years. To give you a sense of uh, our endowment, uh, the green bar is what I would call our true endowment. It's about $26 million today. Uh, that's where we do a draw and that subsidizes uh, our operating budget. The blue bar is something that we call other invested funds, and what we do there is we uh, utilize those funds in order to understand uh, our debt service related to a lot of the projects that we've done uh, in the past. So we use that as a pool of funds to, to assist with that. Uh, to give you an example, though, starting at $11 million, close to $12 million in 2009, right when I started at 26, uh, every part of every campaign has been uh, an endowment component, and this has been huge. Again, if you look at a you know, $15 million difference and we're drawing 5% of that, that provides a huge boost uh, to our, our operations funding everything from colleague compensation to financial aid uh, and a variety of other things. Uh, so a question from last year uh, we wanted to pull forward is our, our salaries. And this is for teaching colleagues. Our mean base salaries are around 60500 That's a base salary. And the total salary, 62811 uh, dollars uh, That would include anything uh, extra that uh, some of our folks are paid for, uh, maybe like deaning a class, um, uh, some are doing Coaching, coaching, um, academic recovery, things of, of that nature. Um, 
That has gone down slightly from the year before, and the reason is we've had a larger group of colleagues who have retired out uh, as we've brought new folks in. Um, so that's a deceiving slide. I'll get to the compensation study in a minute. Uh, our non-teaching salaries, anybody um, from our physical plant department uh, all the way through um, administrators, we do a combination of uh, statistics from local schools. Uh, PAVEBO is a group of about 130 schools in the area, uh, and about 80 of those participate in the survey. So we're able to look at compensation across uh, all 80 of those schools to understand what the low end is, high end, and, and the average for a variety of positions, uh, including teaching, but teaching is a bit more complicated because of, of some of the duties. So to give you an understanding what a, so, uh, a total comp package might look like, we use the middle column, 60,000 being roughly the average. Uh, we pay our portion of FICA tax. Our medical, again, about 11,800 uh, is our average package. Uh, lunch, there's an old saying, there's no such thing as free lunch, except that <laughs> shipping <laughs> for our colleagues. Uh, retirement benefit, we put in 5.5%. Colleagues put in 3% of their own money. Uh, it's beyond the dollar for dollar match, only it's a two for one match. Uh, 5.5% give you a total comp package of uh, about $81,000 there, about 35% uh, of that package is, is benefits. And we offer a variety of, of some other things there. So we are going out on a compensation study. It's something we've wanted to do uh, for a while, part of our strategic plan. Uh, we're doing a couple of tenets of this. One thing is to understand what it means to be a full-time teacher here at Shipley compared to some of the local schools. It varies school to school. Is it four classes? Is it five classes? Is it based on the number of students? Do you have other duties like advisory, coaching? Uh, and that will change by division. So we're, we're trying to put together a matrix of what it means to be a full-time teacher in the lower school here compared to the uh, schools in the area, uh, middle and upper. We, we did this about uh, 12 years ago. This will be very interesting to see what it looks like and how things have changed at other schools. Yeah, I, th I think Steve and I sense is it's really the, the actual responsibilities and understanding, especially as schools are seeing uh, fewer kids in areas. In, in 08, uh, when things were really good, you had the luxury to do things a lot differently and, and how schools might now be transitioning uh, to look at how they, they deal with um, class size, what's an average class size, things of that nature. Uh, our goal really is to develop a more competitive scale <laughs> for our teaching colleagues. I don't know what the result of the study is going to be. We're hoping to completed by uh, May or June of this year. Um, my guess is it will take a series of years for us to implement, but really the goal is to uh, have a benchmark and move towards that benchmark to really be more competitive in the area with our teaching colleague uh, salaries. But and by the way, before it's actually done, we can tell you what I'll say, it probably won't surprise you, but when you look at salaries in the areas, where do you think the highest salaries are? That's absolutely true. Right. And among the independent schools, there are schools that started as started as all male institutions, and right, and so, you know, which coincides, by the way, with where endowments are too, just so you have a sense of it. And uh, the other salaries of schools that have that started as all girls schools or are all girls schools tends to be a little bit lower on both of those sides. That's one of the things that over the next generation plus, all of our schools need to really be aware. Of. Just as, by the way. I know Adam alluded to this, but we're incredibly grateful for the support from the annual fund and also what endowment does. If you put those numbers together, that means it's about between four and five million dollars a year that we have to raise just to break even, right? Because tuition doesn't. On the, another way to look at that is how grateful we are for those contributions to be able to make things happen. The model associated with independent schools which is you simply raise the difference is not the most productive one from a business <laughs> perspective. But it's the challenge because tuition increases speak for themselves. We'd like it to be lower. But you can see as healthcare goes up, for example, that's a cost we're going to get no matter what happens. So what do you do? Yeah. I mean, my son's a sophomore in college studying finance, and we had a discussion. I said, how to not start a business <laughs> is build a widget, sell it for 100 bucks, and then have to go up, raise another $20 on top of that in order just to break even. That's not the way uh, you should do things. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough model, and it's in all of education. So, uh, you know, 
at some point something needs to give. And I, again, I'll go back to healthcare. That's one of the biggest areas of concern because no matter how well we can manage costs and be efficient, we could be hit with a 17% increase in healthcare tomorrow. And we will. Um, so Josie and I are going to focus on Shipley's 125th celebration, which is coming up next year. It's going to be a year-long celebration starting this May, kicking off this May with Alumni Weekend, and all the way through till next May, June. Um, and we, I think it's the perfect kind of petri dish for all the things we've been talking about in engagement, and I think a real opportunity kind of kick things up to the next level. I would say we really started our engagement um, efforts several years ago with our parent um, population. And again, thank you to all of you in the room who've been very actively involved in that. And I'd like to think that um, some of the fruits of our labor were evident on Friday night with the success of our Swamp Night. It's our third annual one. And I think it shows the power of what we can do when we bring a lot of different elements of the community together. And I think we're going to take the opportunity to see what we've learned from our parent engagement efforts to see how we can amp up with all of our constituencies. Um, there are a lot of words on this slide, but um, we really look at this as an opportunity to further unify and engage all members of um, the Shipley community. And we've been working with Brownstein Group. In fact, I have a meeting with them this afternoon, our marketing firm, to help us develop not only the creative, but some kind of strategic messaging. And an observation they came up with is founded by trailblazers Hannah, Catherine, and Elizabeth Shipley in 1894. Throughout its history, Shipley has demonstrated that the unconventional path is worth exploring. Controversy is necessary for change. There's no greater pursuit than character. And in today's world, power, positive education creates powerful and courageous leaders and agents for change. So um, we're, we're having a lot of fun kind of working on the language and what some of the creative and what some of the signature events might be. Um, there are really three goals um, from an overall, um, overall perspective. Educate, and um, some of you know Trina Vox, who is my predecessor, who has been working on a really definitive history of the Shibley School for the last six years. It's about, it's just about ready to go to publication. It's about 400 pages, and it's really, it's really fascinating. We've already started integrating an element into each of our, um, our all-school assemblies with the kids on, um, on the history, and it's been really, really fun and, and gratifying to see how we, the lower schoolers, a group of lower schoolers did it in, um, in November where they actually presented a piece on the Shipley sisters. We had a meeting with them to go through some of the archival materials. They read letters from the Shipley sisters to their father who kind of funded the operation. And then just um, the assembly last week, one of our seniors, La Brea, um, is actually talked about African Americans um, <clears throat> coming to Shipley. And one of the first African American students at Shipley is her mentor and benefactor. And she's had the opportunity to, to, to meet with her. So we're trying to do it in not a kind of a bat you over the head, in your face way, but to really have the kids um, kind of learn more about. Energizing, um, you know, we really think that this is an opportunity to en energize all aspects of the community, including local community, people who have worked here before, alumni, past parents, etc. And engagement is kind of the, the ultimate goal. You may not be surprised that there will be um, a campaign financial element to this. And with that, <laughs> we didn't have an anniversary without a fundraising um, campaign. No. It's so true, it's, a, it's a, a, a real opportunity to pull together all constituencies that are part of this community. So we will have a fundraising goal around program. Um, you recall we just completed a campaign that was all about capital, so now it's about what happens in the buildings um, and supporting that, and we are working on that goal with the board. We have a board retreat on March 3rd where we, where we will go in depth in this. It's also an opportunity to um, to highlight participation in giving. Uh, we have a, a really generous um, parent population here, and I thank you, I echo, echo the thanks this morning uh, for the annual fund support, um, and that will be a part of this, uh, and just driving participation in giving. So we'll have goals set for each constituency in that regard. More to come. <laughs> and um, last but not least, the plan is really for a year of moments, and um, at the risk of um, annoying my, my supervisor, um, there will be plenty of opportunity to celebrate Steve and 
what he's okay. contributed <laughs> to the school. Um, we're going to turn. We will cloak a lot of that in Shipley, but for those who are wondering, there will be ample opportunity um, to kick off. We're, we're going to have some new signature events, but we also really want to integrate it with existing events. One of the things we talked about is, for example, Shipley Shops. How could we you know, celebrate and honor folks who ran Shipley Shops 20 years ago um, and, and really kind of bring, bring uh, a celebration of the history into every element? And we will also be reviewing this at the March board retreat. Um, and some of you are participating. I think there's a kind of a group that's getting together on February 20th that includes colleagues, um, some alumni, board members, parents, our ambassador leaders, to really um, kind of really brainstorm and backward design on the 125th to say, you know, and gather all of our, our all of our ideas so that we'll kind of have a month by month day by day, minute by minute, uh, plan for the celebration. With that, turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank any, you. any questions okay. on any of the pieces that have been presented? Did you find that informative, I hope? Does it make sense? If you let yourselves process it, it will stir some thought for you, questions, and please don't hesitate to contact us with them. Let me come. First, I want to, would you join me in thanking the team? I love this in a lot of ways because, of course, it's all tied to our strategic plan. But one of the things I like best is that we're going through this year and next year for our 125th, is if you think about what the foci associated with it. On the one hand, you heard about, uh, well, Margaret's disappeared, but <laughs> she's not been But as Wendy was talking about, the program, and particularly around, uh, you know, educational excellence and all of the things with the appropriate integration of positive education. Now, bear in mind, you've got to see here <coughs> that way back when, the school was about character and, and, and the education of the whole child. It, one of the nice things about positive education, that's what it's about. And it's steeped in wonderful research that indicates that kids actually do better. So I love that. I love that the focus of our campaign efforts over the next year and a half to two and a half years are going to be around those kinds of things. And if I get it right, and I know not all of it is resolved, but it's going to focus around, of course, our kids and the ability to draw more great kids into the school. So there'll be that side of it. There's a part of it about, of course, our colleagues. Frankly, our kids tell the story, but without the colleagues in the school, it doesn't happen. So I love that it's going to be about that. And I love that really I think that I, uh, what was said about what's inside the building, that really is, is what defines Shipley. And in fact, it defines any, any school that is really. It's, it's wonderful that we have these facilities that have happened. And I've been here long enough, as some of you have, is that people used to look at our facility and go, nice, sweet. But really, what inside? Now, some of the parents know that. Nobody says that. We're very, very, very fortunate. So one of our objectives has to be, as we deal with, of course, all the infrastructure and other things that you have to do in school, is making sure we don't get to a place where we think we're entitled. Making sure that it is what's inside that really matters. And I, would, and I love that that's the focus. So when you look at the campaign efforts for next year, the third part I alluded to, it, will be around the formal integration of the excellence with the positive education piece. And my dream down the road, it doesn't come from me, it comes from others, is I really do see the time when Chipley will be within the United States, the leader in that regard, and that we will have, I'm looking at Sharon, because she'll still be here, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 be a, a grounds for, for teaching it and doing it, not just here, but just as we have a whole group headed to uh, Australia, they were in Texas, and Australia for a, literally a global thing on this. Where, by the way, there are many more schools <coughs> who do this. It'll be exciting. So, questions on anything? Yeah. As a um, parent of a second grader, and I've got a long time, hopefully, left to Shipley, you know, you look at the positive education, the character development, those are skills that are going to, our children will hopefully take on and use for the rest of their life. When you look at the 2022 curriculum plan, how do you look forward to determine what the curriculum is going to look like 
And also, the product that the that Shipley puts out, its graduates, will be uh, c colleges will look at that type of curriculum. Yeah. So, so let me say this. It's, it's a perfect question. Let me say this. First of all, is colleges are usually behind, right? Because they're admitting off of what is, and they're admitting off of. And if you look, um, it sounds funny, but uh, curriculum in our schools is usually well ahead of what particularly curriculum for freshmen in college is. Why? Because remember that the curriculum for freshmen in college has to take a huge range of kids from dramatic backgrounds, different backgrounds, and make sure that they can do it. So their integrated and interdisciplinary work tends to be at a much higher level. In that context, we actually meet with admissions people on a regular basis about what they think is important. So if Janet Kaboski or uh, Don Yelkin were here or Sarah, they'd be telling you that. Every time we're entertaining a change of significance, we have those meetings. So for example, it's about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, we eliminated advanced placement exams. And a lot of people went, oh. you know what the colleges said? Great. They said, we don't judge the school on the AP exams, we judge on what we see in terms of the skills of the kids bringing. And we, meaning the colleges at the time, have more confidence in your curriculum, the idea of critical thought being what it is, and the importance of it. So in that regard, and if you're familiar, and you wouldn't be yet, because Thomas is young, but as you move to the middle and upper school, the emphasis on interdisciplinary and integrated curriculum is only going to grow. We can tell you that. Now what the particular foci will be is hard to know, but if you're asking the questions, you have a chance of making that transition. So for example, in our upper school, you see you know, the STEAM program, which is, we, we've done a lot of things. I met this morning with some of our kids who are involved in the admissions process, and one of them talked about the engineering course that taking, that wouldn't be, you know. So it's the confidence that Margaret has this group. You know who the best group in that is? The kids. The kids are terrific, uh, and it's really fun to listen to them about looking out and again, what are they gonna need? I can tell you this in advance. I can't give you the specifics, but you are only gonna see the need for more integrated thought, great critical thought, and the ability to have the skills we're talking about, the, the resilience, the zest, the diligence, you can go on and on, grit, all of those things. It's gonna be more and more important. If you've seen any studies associated with uh, business today, Fortune 500s and others. Some of those Fortune 500s have changed uh, foci. You know, they're, they're, they're different than they once were. But you know what's common? You know what the skills and attributes are that they say are most important? Adaptability. They, adaptability is one, is one of them. What else? Resilience, determination, passion, uh, all of the things we're talking about. And you have to be bright. I mean, that's a given. You have to be, bring those skills. But they want all these skills. Being bright at the, with the, the, at the expense of these other things is not sufficient. And in fact, even when you look in the tech world right now, right, and there have been some terrific people, what are they saying? Same thing. When they're looking to hire people, it's actually interesting. Some companies that began with the whole idea that it was tech only have now come to the place that they actually, some of their most innovative and best ideas have come from people who may not be able to develop them because that's not their background, but who bring what we're talking about. So, great question. Other questions? Come on. You know, selfishly, I, I mean, I look at it and I, I, I want to come back and see what it's all about. Because uh, the one thing that hasn't changed, and I've had the privilege to be in education for 40 years now, uh, is the kids. It's got to be about the kids and their development. And we as parents and educators bring our own biases. Well, at least I do. You know? And we sometimes have to be able to get out of our own way to understand what's really best for them, particularly over time. You know, in the moment, whether it's a behavioral thing or an academic thing, we want to remember it's a process. And by the way, while I as a parent never wanted to have my kids suffer at all, you know what they learn most from sometimes? Suffering. Yeah, quote, suffering. The disappointments, the falling down. Those, that's what companies are telling you are important. That's what graduate schools 
are telling reporter. You know what some of the graduate schools are telling you is it's, it's not always the best natural academic student who's doing the best work the further they go, for all of the same reasons we're talking about. So it's interesting. Questions on anything you've heard today, or about anything. So let me take uh, just two minutes and just fill you in on uh, the search processes I know and associate, because I think it's relevant. And I'm not the best person to talk about this, but it hasn't been, you know. Um, you know, first of all, my thanks to everybody who, who has been nice enough to drop me a note or whatever. I do find it funny. I was very ambivalent before making this announcement. Um, the truth is, the closer I got to it, the more I went, maybe I just want to stay three or four or five more years now. But in the end, when I made the announcement, I actually thought it was the right announcement. Um, most importantly, you know, for us, but, but for the school. I think it's a good, it, it's a good thing. Uh, you're going to get somebody and I'm not going to spend the next year and a half talking about this, but uh, you're going to get somebody who's going to take it to a whole new level, which will be terrific. And our job over the next year and a half is making sure we're perpetuating, we're fostering the questions and things so that when that person becomes the head, so that all of you who are still here are going to push that level of excellence even further. That's what good schools do. And so the decisions we make are geared accordingly. And uh, the last thing I'll say in, in terms of you know, myself is, you know, I sort of smile. Not many people get the opportunity to celebrate two anniversaries, the 125th, right, in the course of a career. If you think about it, I had the pleasure to do it in almost the least amount of time it would take. If my successor does that for the 150th and 175th, she or he will be here for 50 years. So <laughs> if that's true, none of you will be parents in the school, and it'll be interesting to see. Okay, search process. As I understand it, and board members may be better about this than I, but uh, I don't know if there's any more. But uh, search, there's a search committee that's been put together, and it's just begun to meet. And it's begun by, I think, if I'm not mistaken, meeting with search firms. And in the next week or two, the best I can understand it, a search firm to work with us will be hired. Have I got that right? I think I do. And then what will happen is that there will be, if I understand it, uh, a, a parent advisory group, a colleague, no, not right? Okay, there'll be parent involvement, marked involvement in it that will, will come out accordingly uh, and others. And the, the search firm will be starting by meeting with different constituencies about wh what the school's going to look for, where you're going to be, all of those things. The time frame associated with it, you know, is in the ideal world, it will get defined pretty quickly. They'll begin the search process and maybe early next fall we'll actually have people to campus and or we'll <coughs> have an appointment. The sooner we have an appointment on some levels, the better it will be in the context of beginning to work together. Questions on that? So I think within about the next two weeks, I'm looking at Sue, there'll be a communication that comes out both with a reiteration of my announcement and, and Brooks and Wiley's uh, letter, and also perhaps some further information about this. So questions on any of that? Is, yeah. there, is there about a year overlap? Where no, you, you don't, you, not there? actually when you work together. The, the hire is for July 1 of 2019. Take my word for it, no one would want to work with me during my last year. <laughs> um, yeah, and, you know, and that includes my colleagues. Uh, you know, um, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's um, rare, on rare occasion you'll get a couple of months, but it depends on what that person's doing, you know, the, the person who will come in. Uh, but you can imagine that that person will start uh, July 1, 2019? 2019. Any, any questions on anything else? Any observations? Yeah. So um, I don't have a question. I have an observation sure. that I'd like to share. I think one thing that's really special about Shipley is something you shared here. And that is that despite the facility improvements, it is what is inside that matters. Um, and my son just started squash. and. What was most powerful to me was, was two things on a recent friendly they had. They had Philadelphia Country Club come here. We went there and then they came here. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's learning how to score. He's calling it match. I used game. to coach it and I had no idea what I was doing. Game was match. And, 
But what was most special was two things. And it, it wasn't how pretty the screens were or the nice paint in the new squash courts. It was that you came by. I lost my way around, so I found <laughs> That you came by and, and you were there for something that was a sixth grade intramural, people don't even know if it's a game or a match. And, and that meant something. And that in between each game, two much more seasoned squash players came out and were like peer coaching my son in between games and telling him what to do. Well, thank you. Uh, let me say, I, have, I had nothing else to do that afternoon. <laughs> uh, you know, let me say this though. I said, you know, look, I, I have no idea. People know this. Um, in my perfect day, I would never be in my office. I, I mean, I tell you the truth. I, I so much have always enjoyed more watching squash or a play or whatever. But it, it, first, it's selfish because it's really fun. But the second part is it's where you actually get to know the kids. That's my view. You know, I said I, I I get to know people by association. I so I do. So in the lower school, if I've read the kids, I remember that kind of thing. But as they get older. It's a great opportunity to do that. And I'm sure whoever comes in, first of all, I, I think that the things that you're talking about are central to the school that we are. Mm -hmm. And what I'm confident about as I have heard where they're going to go with this is they're looking for that kind of involvement, whatever that means. Now, and, and people are going to need, when it comes, the person is going to spend her or his first year here learning the community. And your help will be immense in that process. You know, it will make a huge difference. Now, um, I've loved my time here, and I continue to. And uh, it's one of the reasons I'm going to limit these kinds of discussions, because <clears throat> I still have 17 months. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've had people look at me like, you're still here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was me. Sorry about that. <laughs> Me the other day said, I don't have to listen to you anymore. Said, well, actually, it's been great in terms of college. But if you know, if you know me at all, I, 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 I'm not the docile type. So, you know, we are going to be looking to accomplish even more over the next year and a half in, in these areas, ones that you've alluded to and others. And by the way, I too noticed the older kids help. And that, that's, that's really what it's about. And, and it's one of the reasons that we're stressing the strengths as we are. And, and by the way, Cher, I don't know if it's possible. To, it wouldn't hurt you as parents, as you know, to check your own strengths. You begin to look at yourself and you go, "Oh, really?" You know, when I did when I did mine, you know, I did mine the first time. Around. So mine were uh, Sharon will help me remember about that. Great, but I don't. Have, I, don't I do have it, but I don't. Have, I have, it happens to be sitting on my desk. It's gratitude, honesty, love, kindness, and zest. I had six that were, were right there, and I thought to myself, it's too bad leadership's not there. But that's what. <laughs> but, but, then, but then what I really thought was I realized is that when you read the whole report, is those those tend to be the skills you use, in my case, to try to lead, right? So leadership, I see, is, you know, and you go from there. But it, it, it'd be very, very interesting for you. You know, I did it, I went, and then you look at the rest of the list and you go, I'm not that, 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 you know, whatever. We just do this quickly. Margaret, what were yours? Uh, so, um, sorry. Uh, no, my card with me either. Um, come back to me in a minute. Okay, when, Wendy's got her card. I have mine, right here. Um, creativity, honesty, love of learning, fairness, kindness, and perspective. And if you know this person, it's true. Go ahead. Uh, curiosity, forgiveness, love, fairness, gratitude, and love of learning. Uh, perseverance, um, honesty, um, kindness, um, leadership, and forgiveness. Gratitude. Gratitude, honestly. Hope. <laughs> <laughs> Humor. Okay. Perspective, social intelligence. Judgment and creativity. Oh, go ahead, um, Honesty, love of learning, kindness, forgiveness, and social intelligence. Uh, perseverance, <coughs> self regulation, love, fairness, teamwork, and hope. Mine were um, honesty, social intelligence, judgment, curiosity, love, and hope. 
Val, do you have yours? Uh, gratitude, social intelligence, mm -hmm. kindness, and love. I don't remember the other. <laughs> Creativity, curiosity, hope, bravery, perseverance, teamwork. Um, judgment, fairness, love, humor, perseverance, and fairness. Okay, so if you, Sylvia, so you have yours? Uh, mine or <coughs> leadership. You don't have that, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Sorry, you so, asked. So, no, actually, I didn't. But, 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 but there's an opening if you'd like it. <laughs> My answers are honesty, social intelligence, and trust Great. Any? So, the, so there are two, th did I miss anybody in the... Oh, Betsy's back here. Betsy's high. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Betsy. Um, mine was, my number one was appreciation of, of beauty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> um, love, honesty, and perseverance. Okay, so I, I, I did this for a reason. First, if you know, there is remarkable overlap in terms of, if you think about what we think is important as a school, in terms of honesty, in terms of, uh, appreciation of kids in terms of love, those things, are there. and yet the other strengths that are so unique to individuals is what brings us together in a way to make sure those are touched on everywhere we go. So it's that combination of things that make communities go, and why we're as grateful as we are. And by the way, uh, my hope is is that over the next year plus, we'll actually get to a place where there's the opportunity for a um, parent, a possible, for those who would like to be part of a quote, parent retreat type opportunity to really understand this better and become part of themselves, just as there will be for the board and others. There is the intent that on an ongoing basis, our colleagues will of course do good work. And again, I don't want you to think about positive education unto itself, because you could think of it as isolated. It's not, Real positive education is about the things we're talking about in an integrated form. That's really the basis, and, and, and that's what we're doing. Questions on that? So let's, yeah, yes, Steve. Uh, well, it just, I would point out one of the experience that I had that kind of, I think, encapsulates all of this. I was on an uh, airplane flight a few weeks ago, and the person sitting next to me was reading a book by Dr. Seligman. So I mentioned that I had seen him in the event man at school, and he knew all about Shipley. He was a doctor in Dallas, and he was trying to implement positive education among the people on his staff. Uh, he's Does he have any children who might want to follow? His children go to independent school in Great. Texas, yeah. and he was, was going to bring up to his school the whole idea. If I told you how many calls we've gotten about it already, and so it's, it's reinforcing to hear that. Some people say, well, does anybody know outside the school? So for you to say that, and I wouldn't have known, of course. But again, you know, it's funny, as someone who's had the privilege to be in education as long as I have, good education, in my opinion, hasn't changed so much. It still focuses on the kid as an individual and all the things we're talking about. I want to appreciate who she or he is, where they're going to go, how they're going to get there, the how really matters. And that's what all of this is about. Because when they graduate from here, or any other school, the hard part is not preparing them for the academics of what's next. No one has ever come back to our school or many others and said, couldn't do the work. Right? It's just not it. It's all of the other things in terms of both school and life. It's the challenges that they're going to face, whether something is what seems as simple but time management, which is not, by the way, simple, to decision making that they're going to make. And we're hoping that the critical thought piece, I mean, you know, we all, went, we all went through that period in our lives with varying degrees of risk taking, right? The challenge is, is that that risk taking for kids of today gets younger, and by the way, potentially, potentially even harder. That's where we go. And then so that when they get to be adults, you know, they're able to meet those two. It, 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 we won't know the impact of the education of our kids simply by where they go to college or how they do. It's really what they do with all of that down the road. 
which from my perspective, more and more and more, though it's a hard view, but that's the distance, and since we're talking about, you know, backwards by design sort of thing, what do we want for them when they get to be adults? You know, that's really the goal. It's an important part. Don't get me wrong, academics, they're all important. We need to prepare them for but it's really what comes next. Anything else? Thanks for taking the time today. We'll see you soon. By the way, when we get to the 125th and other things, ample opportunity to be involved. You love it. You love it. And how many people were at Swamp Night? Any? Seemed like a good night? I love I loved one of the, you know, we've got comments. It's great. We did group. One of them was it was too crowded. That was <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.